Uh, hey guys, and welcome to the Working Money Channel. Chad Steingraber we're bringing this up. BlackRock again meets with the SEC on spot Bitcoin ETF along with Franklin Templeton, Grayscale, and Fidelity. So guys, here's what is happening. This was just from a couple of days ago. There is another meeting or was another meeting rather uh, on December the 11th with BlackRock regarding the Bitcoin iShares Trust. So they are still working hard to make this a reality. He retweeted out James Seifert's tweet here. Uh, nothing groundbreaking uh, to report, but four different issuers have met with the SEC regarding the Bitcoin ETF filings in the last few days. So you guys can see the other ones here too, uh, starting on uh, December the 7th. So just last week, we had Fidelity uh, talking to the SEC. We had uh, Grayscale as well on December 8th, along with Franklin Templeton, also on December the 8th. Uh, and then uh, just a couple of days ago, December the 11th, BlackRock did come in, talk to the SEC about the trust. So here's the update, guys, from Coindesk. BlackRock's Bitcoin ETF now invites participation from Wall Street banks. So now they're bringing in Wall Street, okay? A change to the structure of proposed spot Bitcoin ETFs would enable authorized participants, or APs, to create new shares in the fund with cash rather than only with cryptocurrency, essentially opening the doors to banks who cannot hold crypto directly. I don't know if that's such a good thing, uh, the change to the mechanics of the Bitcoin, uh, or sorry, BlackRock's proposed small Bitcoin ETF opens the door for Wall Street banks, which face restrictions holding cryptocurrencies to play a key role. So um, I guess it's to me, okay, I guess at on the face, on the face value surface level, this is looking to me like a bit of a double edged sword because we can have uh, traditional institutions move into these cryptos and, uh, you know, put in lots of money. However, if we start playing this game where now the uh, now the ETF is not going to be backed by actual Bitcoin and uh, people are going to put in fiat money, fiat currency to help fund this thing or to back it rather. I don't know if that is as good as if they're pure Bitcoin ETFs, uh, in my opinion. Anyway, I don't know. Maybe somebody else has a different viewpoint on that. BlackRock recently made it so that authorized participants, a vital part of the ETF ecosystem, will be able to create new fund shares with cash rather than only with cryptocurrencies. So Again, I get the reason why they're doing this. The the fact that they can do this, hmm, I don't know. As highly regulated U.S. banks are unable to hold Bitcoin themselves, this setup would enable the likes of J.P. Morgan or Goldman Sachs, firms uh, with some of the largest balance sheets in the world, to act as APs to BlackRock's ETF. Whether they want to is another matter, though. Uh, the the cash APs using this process can then be exchanged into Bitcoin by an intermediary and warehoused by an ETF custody provider. So uh, this is kind of a bit of a roundabout way now to, uh, I guess, fund these Bitcoin ETFs, a potential that uh, I guess BlackRock is now uh, proposing to Wall Street. So uh, an interesting update here. Wanted to thank Chad Steingraber just for bringing that up. Uh, but, you know, I think it's only going to be a matter of time before these traditional banks, the legacy banking institutions are going to be able to hold crypto regardless. This one from Flip the Chain, guys, we got Ripple, Metaco founder and CEO Adrian Tracani, okay? And so City was uh, being represented at this event too, along with BlackRock. Custody of digital assets is an enabler to do value added service and start having blockchain tokenization. So tokenization is the next big thing after cross-border payments and Ripple is yet again a pioneer in it. We have BlackRock, Citibank, JP Morgan. They're all following what Ripple's going to do next. Watch this. We tend to say that custody of digital assets is about protecting the keys. It's about protecting the access to the keys through governance, you know, decentralizing the access, and it's about integrating into the existing flows. Once you understand that custody in digital assets is an enabler for everything else, it's an enabler that you need to do the value-added services and to really start having the excitement of what blockchain and tokenization can be about, you can start focusing on the other questions which are around the distribution of, uh, of new forms of assets. You know. So tokenization, essentially that first step before we really get into the tokenization part of it, which is going to be that big mover, liquidity will flow into the market, uh, but they do need that, uh, they do need the custody nailed down, I guess, first, because, you know, with the tokenization, where are you going to hold your crypto assets? You cannot hold them on uh, an exchange or a retail grade solution, you know, similar to what people are doing today, what retail investors in crypto have been doing for the last little while. You need something bigger more robust, at least in the eyes of these financial institutions. Remember, this is going to be billions of dollars of tokenized assets, if not trillions of dollars of tokenization happening in this type of capacity. So they do need a solution for this. And I mean, we've got Adrian Tracani here, founder and CEO of Metaco, which is now a Ripple owned company on the stage with big banks and legacy financial institutions discussing tokenization. So I think that that is uh, really important to point out there. Wanted to thank Flip the Chain for posting that. Uh, guys also happen to see this from XRP Daily. So this has to do with MUFG. 
They've partnered up with Ripple Partner SBI. By the way, MUFG is also one of those banks in Japan that is uh, that has committed to utilizing RippleNet, that consortium of 11 banks. Well, guys, we've got some new news here with regards to uh, tokenization and uh, securities. I think it's Dawa Securities, SBI and R3. And Progmat are partnering to create an end-to-end -end experience for tokenized bond issuance. Okay, that's what it is. Bond issuance here. Uh, Daywa, uh, da da Daywa has developed a bond marketing pre-issuance solution using R3's Corda Enterprise blockchain, and it will integrate with Progmat, the tokenization platform founded by MUFG with backing from SMBC, Mitsuo, JPX, SBI, and others. So some interesting players coordinating here. We know uh, XRP can settle on R3's Corda, so that is a possibility here. Uh, we know MUFG's connection to Ripple, also SBI's connection to Ripple, although it does sound like they are using this uh, this chain here. But that's not to say that there won't be an interoperable solution to integrate into RippleNet if need be. Daywa's bond solution and Progmat use Corda, hence the involvement of SBI R3. Both Daywa and Progmat believe the bond marketing solution is not an investment banking value-added service, and hence hope that other securities firms such as Nomura uh, or SMBC, Nico Securities, might adopt the offering that Nikkei reported. So, uh, Again, they're saying that this is not a one solution fits all proposition here and that, uh, you know, there could be other chains that uh, are included in this. The point, though, guys, is that bonds, whether it's securities bonds, uh, you know, the tokenization of real estate, we've heard about mortgages being tokenized, all kinds of commodities, different types of commodities trading, uh, you know, anything of value basically is going to be tokenized at one point or another. And so this is just another example. We've got SBI Japan R3 in this and their connections to Ripple are quite clear. Also, uh, those Japanese banks are using XRP already. So guys, another interesting connection here. Wanted to thank XRP Daily for posting that. I feel like I'm seeing a lot more VeChain news as of late too, guys. VeChain is witnessing a remarkable transformation with a series of updates this December. So this one, courtesy of Eisenreich on Twitter. The VeChain ecosystem is witnessing a remarkable transformation with a series of updates introduced in December, according to an announcement on X. These changes have the potential to completely alter the blockchain technology environment and present both developers and consumers with new opportunities. So guys, here's the latest from VeChain. Uh, latest updates, we've added a ton of new features to the VeChain ecosystem over the past couple of months, from VWorld to VORJ updates, to the launch of a brand new DAP kit, purpose-built to empower developers. So uh, I will link this in the description if you guys want to click on that uh, and check out the details. VeChain has taken an important step, though, forward by launching VWorld, uh, its official mobile wallet. VWorld has rapidly gained popularity uh, with over 210,000 installations on both Apple and Android platforms. So that's a huge integration there. The advisory uh, is for users to switch by December the 31st as VWorld is slated to formally replace the VeChain Thor mobile wallet. Uh, in addition, the platform provides comprehensive migration instructions to ensure a seamless transition for current users. So that is just uh, one feature there. Uh, they do uh, bring up a whole bunch of other features too, like expanding fiat on-ramps and Ledger Live integration, uh, the VORJ upgrade marketplace as a service, so on and so forth. So again, guys, I will link this in the description for you. I got to say VeChain, another one of those cryptocurrencies, part of my legacy portfolio, but also part of the $10,000 plus uh, portfolio that I'm trading, currently trading with my patrons at patreon.com slash working money channel. One of those altcoins that has the potential to shine. I mean, there's a great company behind VeChain, a lot of utility and a lot of development uh, on that particular blockchain, but it's also one of those big movers. So, you know, in this bull run, we're going to see a lot of different coins do a lot of different things, uh, you know, based on a bunch of different metrics. And so, you know, this coming bull run, I've decided to not just stick to utility coins. That was, um, I think, my big mistake last time around. And if you guys feel like you did not make enough money, you did not make enough trades last time around, you can follow me for only $5 a month. I purposely kept it affordable so that everybody can join the party. I want you guys to follow me until the end of the bull run, whether that's the end of 2024 or into 2025, whenever it is, I'm going to be letting all my patrons know uh, when I'm going to be trading and I'm going to be posting videos in real time. So within 10 minutes of my trades, give or take, I mean, some of these cryptos might fly high sooner than others. So uh, something to think about VeChain, one of those coins though, that I am holding in my $10,000 plus Patreon portfolio. Uh, but I do have another stack, another bag of VeChain that I purchased back in 2019. So getting really, really excited about this bull run, guys. We are seeing more updates, more development. Jeremy Allaire, guys, has uh, come out and said to scale USDC, okay? So he's from Circle uh, and USDC. He says to scale USDC, we could use something like Brad's company. Remember when he said that? Well, guys, here's the latest news here, okay? Circle is looking to collaborate with Nubank to encourage USDC stablecoin adoption 
in Brazil. So check this out, okay? Nubank is a leading digital financial platform that serves 90 million customers in Latin America, including 40 million in Brazil. Nubank offers a variety of financial services such as credit card savings accounts, loans and investments. Nubank also has the uh, Nubank crypto feature, which allows customers to buy and store crypto assets such as Bitcoin and Ethereum directly from the Nubank app. Uh, and down here, uh, uh, according to Jeremy Allaire, CEO of Circle, the partnership reflects a crucial moment in USDC's global expansion. So we got to remember, right now, uh, USDC is sitting here at number seven on coin market cap. I have a feeling Tether's USDT is in the sights of US government and, uh, I mean, regulators globally. And, uh, you know, the other shoe might drop to the point where USDT could be in trouble. So, I mean, th this is part of this narrative that, uh, you know, is still a bit of a question mark. And yes, uh, for my patrons, I am still uh, planning an on-ramp, off-ramp video. I'm sorry, I've just been bombarded with so many different ideas. I will be getting to it. It is on my to-do list. So, I mean, the fact that USDC is looking to make some moves, again, remember, they're the more regulated cryptocurrency. They're the ones that uh, governments are going to rally behind. Uh, so this is a big move. Alaire said that USDC could help drive financial inclusion in Brazil. And, uh, they're saying, you know, so what was it? 90 million. And so they're saying, uh, that USDC can be a safe, efficient and transparent way to access and transact in digital dollars. Uh, meanwhile, Tomas Fortes, general manager of new bank crypto expressed optimism regarding, uh, USDC integration. Fortes said that USDC could provide great opportunities for interested new bank customers to have digital dollars in their portfolio. Fortes also said that new bank and circle will work together on educational campaigns to increase USDC understanding and adoption in the Brazilian market. So that is very, very interesting. We got uh, the partnership news up here too. I will link this in the description for you guys, but you can see uh, the benefit of this Latin America using a, uh, a US dollar denominated stable coin that is fully regulated in many jurisdictions. On top of that, guys, we had Jeremy Allaire discussing the fact that stable coins like USDC or others can use something like Brad's company, meaning Brad Garlinghouse's Ripple, in order to make this a reality. Need I remind you that back in August of 2022, Ripple did launch a crypto-enabled enterprise payment service in Brazil with Travelex Bank. So that was a big uh, foray into the Brazilian market with Travelex. So Ripple already has a relationship uh, with the Brazilian government and the Brazilian central bank. I think it was back in 2020 or 2021 when Brad Garlinghouse had a secret meeting with uh, some somebody over there in Brazil that had to do with, uh, well, they were a government official of some sort. I don't know if they were a central banker or connected to the central bank. Uh, but then later on, we did get the news that Ripple is working with the central bank of Brazil as well. So, I mean, it just is a match made in heaven. And, you know, the fact that Jeremy Allaire did say this, I found a clip. Uh, it was a video I did, actually. Jeremy Allaire says it's Brad's company that is essential to scale global payments. This was from the WEF Davos 2022 summit. So a couple of years ago now, listen to this. Uh, so, you know, we also have Jeremy Allaire stating his opinion on this, this courtesy of XRP Shark here on Twitter. We have to preserve digital cash. That has to work on the open internet. It has to work interoperably with anyone anywhere. That's how we're gonna solve this problem. And I think we're really close. I mean, USDC itself, um, has we've seen over three and a half trillion dollars of transactions directly on the internet between counterparties. And, and so um, if we can you know, improve it with more scalable blockchain technologies like you know, Brad's company uh, provides, and we can make this extremely low cost to, to move uh, and then enable individuals with digital wallets that can, uh, that can interact and you can scale into the risk. Right? So there you go, Jeremy Allaire saying, you know, Brad's company is going to make this more efficient. We're already seeing it happening before our eyes. Partnerships are forming, even if they are not directly Ripple related. We know a lot of these transactions are going to be running through a company like Ripple, through a cryptocurrency like XRP, because it does have real world utility. Another one of those valuable cryptocurrencies that I think we're going to see really pop despite today's price. The underlying utility is what is key for these cryptos and the long-term hold for XRP. That's just my opinion, but I wanna hear what you guys think. Please subscribe to the channel if you haven't already. Like the video if you like the content I'm providing. I always love hearing your comments. See you in the next one, guys.